nice. Okay. Play well with others. I play well with others sometimes. Oh, I have my own. Oh, you have your own. Good morning. I forgot how much I love that song, Trading My Sorrows. It just it just gets in my it just gets in me. It just you know gets inside of me. Um, um, good morning, everybody. Good morning to all of our Facebook listeners or wherever you're hearing us from. Um, thanks everybody for being here and thanks for allowing me to speak. So a group of scientists were standing around arguing with God. They were building themselves up and and, and building themselves in their own mind. They were arguing with God, and they were explaining to God how they could now clone and even make a human being. Okay? This is an old joke, sorry. Um, That their science had progressed to the same level as God. He listened. He was patient. And he said, okay. Let's see. God said, I created Adam out of the dust of the earth. You do it. They bent over to the ground, scooped up a handful of dirt, and uh, just like God did with Adam, and he slapped their hand and he said, make your own dirt. (laughs) I do like that joke, except, and, and it is an older joke, but they are now cloning human beings. So just, there are so many changes just within our own life, in, in our own lifetime. I'm grateful to get to speak with you here today. It's been quite a while, and I got to thinking about it, and it's been almost three years ago, and I know why. Last time I was here, I had just escaped the world lockdown called COVID, was stranded in Cairo, Egypt, and then was stranded in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, And I was very profoundly affected by all of this, and I preached on the lucky dung beetle. You know, the dung beetle that rolls up a ball of poop and pushes it around his entire life backwards and upside down, up and down the hills. So that could explain a little bit why I haven't been here in three years. I just wanted to press y'all with my, uh, after the introduction that I got. Um, There's a very popular world evangelist out right now, and some like him, some don't. He has a huge mega church. After he welcomes everyone in the church, congregation, TV world, he has everyone stand with their Bible in their hands. You may know who I'm talking about. You may not. It it doesn't matter. But he has them hold their Bible in their hands, and all 25,000 people plus repeat after him. And this is just, you know, you can look this up online. I don't have it word for word, but he says, this is my Bible. It is the living word of God. I am what it says I am. Pam knows. I have what it says I have. Every time I open my Bible, I am forever changed, and I will never, ever be the same again. Okay? Uh, Whether you agree with him, like him, dislike him, argue with him, whatever, that statement that he crafted is very, very true and very, very profound. So um, Jenna alluded to this, but if you've been around (laughs) any of us staff at lunch here, you'll figure out that we have some very controversial conversations, mostly courtesy of Bill Shaw and myself. (laughs) If you don't believe me, just ask Cody, Matthew, or Hannah. Every once in a while, we'll look up, and Cody's just running out the door. Oh, I'm home. Well, I'm just all wired up here. Um, What I didn't realize was that for over a year, Jenna wouldn't have lunch with us. But I want you to know she repented. It's all good. It's all good. Had lunch, had lunch with her yesterday. Um, our conversations can get pretty wild and out there, and they are almost 99.9% current conspiracy theories and a whole lot of conjecture. But at the end of the day, we know what the Word of God says, and somebody always has a phone, and we can stop and look up a scripture. Okay, we don't stop and look up to see if Fox reported it correctly or CNN, but we do whip out our Bible and we get that scripture. Maybe we only know one or two words, but we do it. We always get back to our foundation, aka the Word of God. 
It has been such a privilege and an honor to get to watch Matthew and Cody grow and advance in every area of their lives. I didn't know how profoundly I would be affected. To watch them come in off the streets as clients to becoming men, preaching and correctly dividing the Word of God. This is, this is amazing. And what Matthew talked about last week is so important. It is vital for every single one of us. Learn what the Bible actually says, not what somebody told you. Um, my pastor is a world-class evangelist, huge church here in town, and, and it, it didn't matter if it was him or if I was listening to somebody on TV, which I do a lot now. I'm going to check out every single word they say. You know, anybody can make a mistake. You can, you know, we all fumble our words sometimes. But I'm talking about I check out the scriptures that they give to me, okay? And that is our job. So today I want to talk on a very complex topic called replacement theology. I'm looking to see if Patrick's eyes are rolling back in his head. And he said they are. And Jenna's probably are too. And maybe, maybe Pam's. Um, it's very boring, tedious, and can be controversial, um, but I'd like to simplify it for you if I can. <laughs> we have replaced every single thing God said and is saying about us with the trash the world spews out every minute of every single day. <laughs> for me, that's replacement theology, okay? And um, I remember the old phrase we learned when we were children, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Anybody in here not say that ever? Okay, there's no hands. It is kind of correct. They won't hurt you. They will kill you. They will maim you. They will destroy you if you let them. God is divine. God is love. God is my Father and yours too if you have chosen Him. He is the written Word. He is the spoken Word. He is Spirit. He is good. He is I am. He is provision. He is just. He has great labels, names, monikers, whatever you want to call it, mostly because He named Himself. And he eventually created you and I in his image. And it is so understand, it's so important that we understand this, that he made us in his image. Now, y'all, if God says something, it's important, right? Probably ought to pay attention if he says it twice. Third time, it's a smack in the head. He says that three times times in Genesis that we are made in his image. In his image we are created. So I have the family genetics, the DNA and the attributes of my God, my father. And so do you if he is your father. And you even get to make this decision. This decision will never be forced upon you. Um, however, it might be kind of fun to forcefully baptize a few people. There's been a couple that... <laughs> Have come again. I've got to tell you a funny thing. I have this friend. She's about 85, and she's most people think she's my mother because she's about my height, and we act the same goofiness. But she grew up on a ranch outside of Skelly Town. Y'all know where Skelly Town is? I mean, I think there's a post office there, but there is not much. And she was a change of life baby. So her next brother or sister was like 40 when she was born. So she's out there on this ranch between Skelly Town and White Dare, out there in the canyons, the breaks, the mud, the blood, and the beer, and the snakes. I'm here to tell you. She didn't have anybody to play with. All of her brothers and sisters are 40. So she play, her best friends were her chickens. And she loved her chickens. And she baptized, she led every one of them to Jesus and baptized every one of these chickens. <laughs> And I told her one time, I said, God, Ramona, you're going to get to heaven and all these chickens are going to be there waiting for you. <laughs> so anyway, she forced that decision on her chickens, but nobody's going to force it upon you. So uh, this DNA that I mentioned, let's look at, look at that just a little bit. I like science. We now know that we can turn on our, our, our processes and our DNA by our thoughts our words, and our deeds. So for those of us over 50 for sure, and I don't know what the cutoff would be, every single thing that we knew, that we taught, that we were, were taught, that we thought we understood about our DNA has changed. 
And that's just in a short amount of time. What we, what we knew about DNA is just not the same. And I'm telling you, every single thing has changed. I remember when the genome was discovered. I remember when they were mapping it. Anybody else in here remember that? And what we knew was that our DNA was written in stone, so to speak. Uh, you could not change your DNA at all. You were stuck with your code that was written in your DNA. But like everything else, it's changed. We now know that we have the ability to turn on and turn off genetic codes in our DNA. Uh, it's pretty simple to do too. And if you have enough money, you can even get CRISPR technology, which slices and dices your DNA. Anybody in here heard of CRISPR? Oh, yay, Pam. It's C-R-I-S-P-R, -R. okay? Look it up. I Googled it last night just for fun. Uh, I found 15 companies on the first page. It will change your DNA for you. Slice and dice. Slice and dice. Uh, side note, there's a home kit that you can buy, uh, whatever that looks like. I'm not sure, but uh, when it's talking about DNA and chromosomes, I'm guessing maybe don't go with the cheapest one and don't go with a home kit. I just don't, I just, I, we could look like Ramona's chickens, I guess. Um, <laughs> So, we know that our thoughts, whether they're useful or they're destructive, occupy real estate in our brain, okay? Now, growing up, and probably every kid, we used to believe our thoughts were just these kind of ethereal things that floated in, floated out, maybe in our brain, maybe in our heart, but we didn't really, we studied the brain, but we really didn't know about the mind, and we still don't know just a great deal about the mind, and the two are not the same thing, but what we now know is every thought, again, be it useful or be it destructive, will occupy some real estate in your brain, okay? That's pretty profound if you think about it. Um, we didn't believe, we didn't know that they had mass structure, that they were visible. They were just, again, just kind of out there like angels, just, you know, wherever. Um, but we now know different. And we can even image thoughts being formed in the brain. MRA technology, all kinds of different technology. That's relatively new, probably 15 to 18 years. But we can take an x-ray of sorts of your brain of a thought being processed. So, how do you think a thought? It always has to do with words. Words that we say and repeat in our minds to ourselves or out loud, out loud, and even words that somebody else says. And it doesn't even have to be necessarily to us. It could be a conversation, it can be a recording, it can be a podcast. This is why it is so very, very important that we watch the words we speak and the ones we hear. So, what are names? They are words we use to describe ourselves, others, and behaviors. So what are some of the names that we have been given by the world? I'm broke. I'm sick. I'm exhausted. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I'm an independent. I'm a felon. Pink elephant. Liar. I'm a thief. I'm a rapist. A victim. Abused. Abuser. Sinner. Alcoholic. Addict. Drug addict. Codependent. I'm a victim of my biology, my DNA. Um, all my family has cancer. All my family has Alzheimer's. All my family has big thighs. <laughs> all my family has curly hair, you name it. But we claim those. I am a survivor. And most people will tell you that they're a survivor of something, and that's on the good days. I'm a woman. I'm a man. Or today, that takes on new meaning too, doesn't it? I think there's over 700 gender identities. Now, how do you take two genders and you get 700 with it? I don't know. I'm fat. 
palm tree. I'm tired. I'm exhausted, worn out. I'm thin. I'm an overeater. I'm an overthinker, just like my mom and dad were. I'm abandoned. I'm rejected. I'm depressed. I'm lost. I'm an overachiever. I'm young. I'm old. I'm middle-aged. I'm black. I'm white. Rainbow. I'm Hispanic, Mex Mexican, or Latino. I'm tall, short, muscular, workaholic, artist, creative, dolphin. I'm not creative, boring, son, daughter, mother, dad, bossy. I am stupid, smart, brilliant, or just lazy. I'm ugly, shy, pickup truck. I'm a Texan. I'm American. <laughs> I, I am what my genes say I am. I am my genetic biology. My dad, my mother, my grandfather, my great aunt uh, were that way and I'm just like them. And now we've got the whole alphabet soup thing going on now. L, B, G, T, Q, B, X, Y, Z, D, 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 I don't know what all. A, <laughs> yeah, that's right, ADD, ADD, ADHD, AD, A, B, C, we just love that alphabet apparently. 26 letters and woohoo. Did you notice when I was calling out all these things, I threw in there just some funny words that didn't have anything to do with the teaching. Yeah. Pink elephant, palm tree, truck. When I said those, even though they didn't have anything to do with what I was talking about, you saw that in your mind, didn't you? You saw the pink element, you saw the palm tree. Okay, so you can't really have a thought without a word. I mean, they're, they're very, very interconnected. So we have too many words, too many names, too many labels. And thanks to social media, technology, and the world in general, we have too many of them, y'all, and, and we're adding to them every day. Um, it's no wonder that we don't know who we are. And in, in mix of all this, how many times have you been prophesied to? You are this, you are that. It, prophecy is not a bad thing, and I am not saying that, but I have watched people's lives literally be wrecked because somebody said... You're going to be a nurse, thus saith the Lord. Or you're going to be just like your dad. You know, that, that direct prophecy. I love the prophecy that we get here because it's, um, it's not in your face. It's not condemning. And it's not, um, um, I don't know, it's just, not, it's just not in your face. I don't want anybody in my face. Do you all except my grandkids? And they slobber. <laughs> So, again, I did not say that prophecy is bad. It is not. Prophecy is wonderful. It is a wonderful gift from God. So I hope you can kind of see where I'm going with this. We all have a label, name, and it's a description of what we do that has determined our very existence from an early age. Science says that our identity is basically formed by the time we are five to six years old. That's crazy. That is crazy. Oh, so parents, teachers, preachers, aunts, uncles, siblings, bullies have more to say in our development, in our identity, than the one, our Heavenly Father, who created us in our mother's womb. And all the labels that the world gives us are based on something that we do, that we have done, and not who we are. Okay, so I'll get a hold of that. So our personality, our identity was basically formed by the tender young age of five based on bad information or at least very incomplete information. And even though at age five we can't process this, but we do tend to accept it, unfortunately. Just shout out some numbers. What's the earliest age you remember something negative being said to you? Mine's about five. Five? Anybody else? Maybe five to eight. I, I have had people tell me that they remembered stuff from when they were four, especially if they, if they were being sexually abused at three and four. Those memories come flooding back. Uh, and, and here's a phrase we just hear so often. You're just like your father. You're just like your mother. You're just like your brother. Um, you're, oh, I know the Lord's saying you're going to be a nurse. Oh, you're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a drunk. You're going to be an utter failure. You're going to be a preacher. And so we have all of these people, and some of them well-meaning, some of them not, that are telling us 
who we are. And the biggest thing right now that is so, so disturbing to me is we have the world uh, stage, the entire world media telling our five-year-old children that they are not the gender that they were born and that you can change it. Or, and if you don't like that, you can be a dolphin, you can be a unicorn, you can be a Furby, you can be whatever. And again, at age five, this is being accepted. Now, on a lighter note about that, my favorite meme uh, about all of this is on Facebook, and it's a little boy, about five, picking his nose, and yuck, and it says, how can I decide my own gender when I'm still eating boogers? Okay, that's kind of gross. I agree, I hate boogers. But do you see the ludicrousness of that? of that situation, we're letting a five-year-old child determine whether they want to be a boy or a girl when God created them in their mother's womb. So the, we're hearing all these words that are based on sight and feelings versus words based on truth, God's word, and our Father's plan and, and purpose for us. And y'all, this is wrecking our divine identity. I mean... It don't matter how well versed you are in the Word of God. It's still hard. It's still hard to, to, to be alive some days just because of the words. So I'm going to tell you a little story. Shannon will love this. This past summer, my youngest daughter, Kate, in Florida, gave us another grandchild, a grandson. Kate had wanted me to be present at the birth of all of her children. This was her third. But due to Southwest airline schedules, early delivery, and COVID, I wasn't able to be there. But this time, I went out a week early, and I was present. I was very, very present at her delivery. Now, this isn't really kind of important for me because I had emergency C-sections and I really didn't know where babies came from. Mine came down the hall, okay? So now I know where they come from. <laughs> so we, we knew this new baby was a boy and we knew that Kate, my daughter, and Andy, my son-in-law, had the name already picked out. They had worked on it for months. They prayed over it. I mean, they really, really worked on this. But most importantly, we knew that under no circumstances would we be given that name until after delivery. They were adamant about that with all three of their children. This is emphatic. This is a non-negotiable. I didn't understand this completely, but I certainly was respectful of their decision. Unfortunately, today, every single person on the planet with a phone can have an opinion and aren't afraid to use their opinion on private things such as naming your child on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, right? Okay, so um, I, that hasn't happened to me, but I do know it is true. So the delivery was fairly argu arduous. It took 12 hours. It was wonderful. It was full of wonder and awe. Birthing is just amazing. Finally, here came our baby boy, eight pounds, four ounces, tons of blonde hair. <laughs> Shannon's seen my pictures. He looked like a blonde rooster. I mean, dude, <laughs> his kid came out in his hair, and once you wash it, and you wet it and you scrub it all down and five minutes it's drying, it goes and it just stands up. He, he just looks like the cutest little rooster. He was squishy and he was beautiful. The doctor cleaned him up and handed him to Kate and she talked to him and immediately he recognized her voice. That is such a miracle to watch that happen. Then my son-in-law Andy picked him up and he was talking to him. And in one of the most beautiful moments that I've ever witnessed, Andy looked into this second little son of his, in his eyes, he was right in his face, and he told him his name, okay? He said, you are Jackson Lane, that's your name. That is who you are. The baby looked at him, and they just had a moment. This baby's just looking at him, and Andy's just... Right in the middle of the de delivery room, he told his son, who he was. In the middle of chaos, blood, lots of blood, very, very messy, lots of activity, Andy told his son who he was. Most of us never had that moment with our mom and dads. Most of us got our name slapped on a birth certificate and everybody went on down the road. 
And unfortunately, my parents are dead. And I do not know where my dad came up with Danita, but he was in the Navy and in and out of Mexico a lot. So I'm going to go with, okay, maybe. <laughs> Andy told Jack who he was, who he is. He is Jack. They told no one else until they told him his name. They didn't post it on any of the social medias. It was a private moment that I got to witness. Now, his name's Jackson Lane. Well, his little sister, Addie, she's three, and she has a command of the English language, which I shared with some people yesterday. It's quite, quite fun. Um, but she has a little bit of a, a lisp, and so she calls him Jackson Wayne, you know, because she can't say Lane. And you know what? And that's okay, but it doesn't matter. He's not Jackson Wayne. He's Jackson Lane, okay? So just because somebody else says it doesn't change that fact, okay? He is legally, okay? So, so our Father, our loving Heavenly Father is telling us who we are. He, whispered it, he whispers it in our ears. He says, you are mine. You are loved. You are never alone. You are saved. You are redeemed. You are sanctified and set apart for me and me alone. You are my child. You are protected. You are provided for. You are kept and you are adored. You know, we don't use that much anymore, but adore, that is such a wonderful word. Listen to what the Lord says and is saying in your ear your heart and your heart's ear. He's, he's whispering it in. He's not going to scream it in your face. And stop listening to what the world is telling you. It's absolutely killing you. Ask me how I know. It killed me for a long time. Um, the Lord and His conviction has never said to me, it's never gotten in my face and has never said to me, you're a liar. You're a cheater. You're this, you're that. He doesn't, that's something, I do lie. I have done things wrong. I always knew it when I did it. He said, you did something wrong. He didn't say, that's who you are. Amen. Okay. I am a new creation in Christ. I, 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 I'm not that old. I'm not my behavior anymore. And, and I have to stop listening. But the world does it all the time. If somebody's in your face, um, it, it, you feel like that's in your face telling you and you hear it in your head. I promise you that is not the Lord. He doesn't do that. Um, so we have to be careful that we don't let our, um, the labels become our identity. My identity is Christ. Pastor Robert has preached on this a couple of times. My identity is Christ. I am in Christ. That's who I am. I am one in spirit with the Lord God Almighty through Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Son. I'm a divine spirit with eternal life in Christ, eternal, residing temporarily in a meat suit, a.k.a. my body here on earth. And just for a freebie, my resurrection body is going to look a lot different. <laughs> it's going to be tall. <laughs> So getting back to um, this topic, replacement theology. Two words. Stop it. Just stop it. Stop replacing the name the Lord gave you for what the world told you. And here's another freebie. The world lies. Anybody, anybody got that? There is a replacement theology that is good and true and life-giving. Replace every word, label, and name, be it good or be it harmful, with the names that your father is telling you. And don't just give him lip service either. Look into the word of God and get yourself some new names. Matthew talked about it last week. It's not hard, is it? it takes some time. Is it life-giving? Life-changing, life-altering, isn't it? Names that will breathe life into your very being. You are a new creation. The old has passed away. It is dead. Leave it in the grave. It stinks and will suck the very life out of you. You are a child of God. You are a son of the Most High. 
Did you know that we, when we meet Jesus, I'm not sure exactly on the timeline, He's going to give us a rock with our name written on it, a name that only He knows. Remember what I told y'all we thought our DNA was written in stone? Eh, chunk that stone. I want the one with my new name on it, the one that only He knows. And did you know He is going to have His name written on His Thigh. That's Revelation 19, 16. I don't know what his name will be, but I do, and we will. His name will tell us exactly who it is. All of the names of God have been used. They've been used badly. They've used correctly. They've been used incorrectly. But they have become a, a very common, common word. And I do not believe that the name of God... It's common, and I don't think it will be. I think it will be everything but common. I think it will just be like an explosion in our mind. Um, the point is, is that he has a name that he's going to tell us, and he knows it, and it's never been used before. It will be fresh and clean and so expressive. It will tell us exactly who he is, and he's going to give us not only a rock, but a white rock with our new name written in stone. Nobody knows but him. He's going to, just like Andy told Jack who he was, he's going to tell us who we are and he's going to give us a white rock. So what are some of the names that God has given us here on earth? Um, and, and, and let me talk about this just a little bit. There was this uh, movement in the United States Probably in the 70s and 80s, the name it, claim it theology. Remember, name it, claim it. Uh, if you wanted a new house, you just went out and found it, and you said it was yours, you took a picture of it, you named it, you claimed it, you prayed for it, you did it every day, or a diamond ring, or a new bicycle, or, you know, I don't know, whatever you wanted, I guess. And supposedly you would get it. It did face a lot of scrutiny, but it was a very popular theology at the time or a movement, um, but it did face a lot of scrutiny, scrutiny, and rightly so. But what if we take that principle, name it and claim it, and we fully and willingly claim the names that he has for us? What if we get in his word like Matthew did and we find the names that he actually has for us? Saved, eternal, sanctified, healed, whole, complete, lacking no good thing to complete the work for which he has called us. Lacking no good thing. I mean, I, I like that. I'm going to name claim that. This is another one because I am, I am a researcher we are co-heirs with Christ. This is a legal term, and it is mighty, and it is powerful, and it will pipe light to you if you're not careful. Has anybody in here ever had dealings with the legal system? Few, okay. Co-heir is a formal legal document that was filed between Christ and myself, the God the Father. It's legal, it's legit, and it is binding. And why is this important? Co-heir means that we share in an inheritance. It's legally ours, and we didn't do anything to get it. So we share Christ's inheritance. What is Christ's inheritance? Well, the Bible says that everything has been given to Jesus through God his Father. Therefore, we're co-heirs in everything with Jesus. Everything that is Jesus is, is ours. Y'all, that's good news. I got any, mil any millionaires in here, billionaires in here, massive landowners? No, me neither. Okay. But we are co-heirs with Christ in everything. So here's a few more names on earth. We are filled with the fruit of the Spirit, a.k.a. Spirit-filled. We're free. We're joyous. We're peaceful. We... Don't just have it, but we have that peace that passes all understanding. We are one in spirit with God the Father through Jesus the Son. We are one in spirit. We share the same mind of the Lord God Almighty. 
That, that, to me, I can't even get my head around that all the time. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 17. We're more than conquerors. We are victorious without a bloody mark on us. The battle is His, Deuteronomy 24, 2 Chronicles 20, 15. We are eternal, Ecclesiastes 3, 11. We are loved, chosen, son, a child of God. We are beloved. Beloved. So I want you to think about name it, claim it. Claim some of these names. Claim them. And claim them and claim them and claim them. Push the old ones out. They're in your head, but you can push those thoughts out. So I want to close now. If everybody would bow your head. This is just a little private moment. Who in here wants a new name? A new identity? One that issues forth like living water. If that's you, raise your hand. Now leave your hand up. Who in here, who in here, in this room, and in, in hearing my voice, will forgive every person that has called you a name that God has not said? Because we do have to forgive them so we can push that thought out. I see your hands, There's lots of them. This is amazing. Let it go. Leave it dead. It already is. Who in here wants to know this life-giving Father that you haven't really known before, but you knew? You knew He was looking at you, talking to you, just like Andy did Jack. Jack came out of the womb. He hadn't looked in his daddy's face, but he knew his daddy when he saw him. I'm talking, I'm talking four to five minutes after being born. That just like in that delivery room, you feel like you're in the... <coughs> the mud, the blood, and the chaos, and you just don't know how to do it anymore. It's overwhelming. Father, our divine heavenly Father, so amazing that we can't even think on who you are, but Lord, we are willing to look and really listen. We know that you are our God, our Father, our everything. Today, I accept you, Jesus, and your word and your death on the cross for me. I accept your resurrection for me. I receive your new name for me gladly and gratefully. Today, I will focus on you, your word, and your names for me. And Lord, when my thoughts and casual speech stray, bring me back with my new name and my new creation. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.